out singing this morning, 453.
of course, a number of us are going over to that meeting uh, this afternoon. So last reminder, there's no afternoon service today um, if you're hanging out here. Um, so pray for the trip if you're not going. Pray for everyone traveling over there. Uh, pray for a good meeting. Uh, a number of people are traveling, and uh, the church over there in Missoula has already had some this morning. They had two different pipes break, one leaking through to the floor below, and so all kinds of stuff going on. So, of course, right before they're starting a meeting, so um, so because it, it kind of pretty much started this morning. So so pray for them, getting everything kind of squared away and, and you know, uh, everything to get worked out there. Um, and also no Wednesday night uh, service, so uh, don't show up then either. And then uh, next week we have our anniversary meeting. Um, so there will be no afternoon service next week as well. Um, obviously, if you're coming, bring a, a side or dessert or both if you can. Um, we're going to go to the park uh, right after the morning service and, and spend some time out there. Um, and also be prepared to uh, wait and a testimony for it. That's you, isn't it? Or we give an old testament. Everyone. Everyone be ready for a testimony. So be ready to say a word. Uh, maybe you'll have something after the meeting if you went to that. If you didn't. Get some from the Lord this week. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then today, right after the service, so uh, if you get your kids out of nursery, uh, whatever you got to do, but as quick as possible, we're going to all meet out right out here and we're going to do a photo. We did that last year, so we're going to be able to compare them, see who left the church and who's new. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, but right after church, just go straight out there. Uh, you can fellowship out there. We'll get a big, big group photo. And uh, yeah, so uh, don't forget that. All right, let's do some more singing. Okay, let's stand and sing a couple more. Let's turn to 447. 447. And then we get there, let's pray before we go further. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for the beautiful weather you've given us. Thank you for that. It's been real enjoyable. And uh, Father, we pray that you'd be uh, pleased with the singing you're hearing this morning. Lord, we know it goes up before your throne, and we pray that it put a smile on your face. We're thankful for you, and thankful for giving us the voices to sing to you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 447.
peace in your heart. Not everybody has that. I hope you appreciate it if you do. Sometimes you got to sit back and think about it for a minute. Do I have peace in my heart? And the Holy Spirit inside of you gives a calm reassurance that no matter how bad it gets, everything will be okay. An old preacher said uh, many years ago, what's got you shaking in your boots this week? That was at the first Missoula meeting I ever went to, and I had just gotten a brand new pair of boots for my wife for my birthday. And I thought, how did he even know to say that? <laughs> I mean, maybe he said it all the time. I don't know. I only heard it once. And then I thought, you know, he's right. He's right. There's nothing to be worried about. There's nothing to be fearful about. And all the uncertainty and all the horrible possibilities you can think of, most of them will never come to pass. And you say, well, that's because I worried about them so much, so that's why they never come to pass. I just want to have all my bases covered, and the Lord says that's not the best method. There's a better method. Amen. Plan A is a much better method, and it's trust the Lord and do right, and he'll take care of you, and he'll give you leadership and guidance in the things as you need it, when you need it, and he's always faithful. Turn to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to try to be quick today. That means nothing coming out of the words of the voice of a preacher, but I am going to make the attempt. A number of us are trying to get on the road today, so uh, if you would, right after the service, let's get the photo right away. So don't be shy and all this humility of, I don't want to get my, we know everybody's in the same boat, just get right out front, right away, somebody run and get the nursery workers, we'll get a camera set up, or you get all this plan, okay, we'll do the little timer thing on the camera, and just try to get uh, four or five or so pictures, whatever it takes, uh, and try to get everybody quickly, quickly uh, get a picture here. We went through um, building these slides, and you're going to see like the first minute or so of the slideshow that Scarlett built. It's like there's no people because we didn't take pictures of every. Who comes to church and like takes pictures of everybody at church? You're like, well, hopefully I see him next week. You know, you don't. <laughs> so, so Scarlett's been taking pictures the last few years, and some other people we scrounged up some photos, but uh, um, it's just it's just nice to have. I mean, you look back ten years and say, hey, there are some people. That moved on and did something for the Lord. There's some people that we were helped to, and they were helped to us for a time. And it's a blessing to see people come and go. My old preacher said the church is like a train, and the train has a direction. The Lord gives the church a direction, and it's on a track. And Lord willing, uh, the Lord's the conductor of the thing, and we're all passengers on that train. But people get on and off the train at every stop, and that's fine. That's okay. You have to learn that we're not a cult. Some people have to be told this, right? You're allowed to leave, and you're allowed to come back, and it's okay. Because You know why? Because we're not a cult. Well, you believe a bunch of strange, everybody believes strange things. We're no exception. Neither are you, no matter what group you're in. Okay, so that, that's what makes it different. Um, we're going to have some uh, testimony and singing next week. I think we'll keep the preaching real short. And uh, if you guys don't all accuse me of being a heretic, we might not even do preaching. Um, there's nothing in the Bible says you have to preach every Sunday. Uh, you ought to hear some preaching every day, I think. Well, once a week, I don't know how that gets you through 167 hours, but here we are. Um, so we'll do uh, some testimonies and singing, at least uh, mostly that. And, and not everybody has to give a testimony, but if you'd like to, maybe be thinking about something this week that the Lord has helped you with, something through the church or through the body of Christ recently in your Christian life. And especially if you went to Missoula, uh, so if you're going to Missoula and you come back, you ought to be ready to give a testimony, all right? And I'm going to know who's there because I'm going to be there too. Okay, First Samuel 17, First Samuel 17. Uh, Saul is a mess, and uh, we're going to have to spend some more time with Saul in a couple messages in the following weeks. But I want to look a little bit about David's life here today. And 1 Samuel 17 is the famous chapter of David and Goliath. And in order for David to get down there to uh, see the battle, he has to go there on these circumstances that don't even seem likely that he would be in battle. David wasn't told, make sure you're ready, make sure you bring a sword, make sure that you bring some armor, make sure that you do your training this week. I mean, double up on your training and be ready. David didn't get any notice. David just shows up with a string rolled up in his pocket. Amen? He just had a little string. didn't even have the ammo for it. He just figured he'd find that along the way. If he could find the smooth ones, that'd be the best. And David shows up there and all of a sudden finds himself in a battle. And the Christian life is much the same way. You ought to just should be ready all the time to be in the battle. 
you don't ever know when that phone call is going to take a turn that you've been waiting for for 15 years for that family member that you just can't ever get a crack in the door open to say something. You don't know when that's going to happen. And you need to be right with the Lord and you need to be ready to speak. You don't know when you're going to get lamb blasted or side side swiped with a Bible question uh, about some off the wall topic, crazy thing. But in answering that question, you can lead it back to salvation. And I found that when I'm reading my Bible and I'm in prayer faithfully and I'm talking to the Lord, that the things that come up in daily conversation are the things that I was just reading or studying that week. Now, that wasn't me doing extra duty training, saying, man, I know we got a big hit coming up and we got to be ready for that. It wasn't that. It was just every day trying to be ready and trying to be faithful. And the Lord's faithful. and You ought to be faithful. The Lord says, be holy. Heard it on the radio this morning, for I am holy. The Lord's holy. You ought to be seeking holiness. I didn't say sinful, per sinless perfection. I said, just holiness. Just say, hey, Lord, uh, I want nothing between my soul and the Savior. What can I do, Lord? What can I do that would be pleasing to you? Look at 1 Samuel 17. Let's read a couple verses and get to our text here. 1 Samuel 17, start in verse 20. David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded. Who did he leave the sheep with? A keeper. That's good to remember for one moment here. Uh, and went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. No fighting, but they're getting ready to fight. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper. That's uh, the bags that he brought with him of the things his father had him bring. He, brought, he left the carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. David's conversation gets interrupted here. And he hears Goliath saying, send out a man that we may fight. And uh, if you send out a man to fight, then we'll be uh, his servants if he beats us. And if you beat us, then we'll be your servants. And, you know, nobody's going to keep their word. Nobody's going to keep their word in a contractual verbal agreement on a battlefield. <laughs> it's all just talk and banter. It's all just people shouting whatever they think. It's almost like uh, Monday morning on the job site. Just everybody jabbering about their opinions about things that they... What opinion do you have about a 300-pound linebacker and you have information to give us about? I mean, just, I don't know much about football, but I mean, what do you have to add to this scenario? Like, like anyways, it all just goes on every day. So they're bantering and going back and forth. Verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. So every time he pops up and comes out there and starts throwing his weight around, everybody backs off that's, that's in the area, and they're all scared. In verse 25, the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now hold on a minute. You signed up to be in the battle of the Lord's army in the nation of Israel, and I know you're forced into it at 20 years old and you train, but it's just your job to fight the enemy. Whether you get enriched, whether you become successful, whether you get the king's daughter, whether you have uh, this tax-free status in, in Israel, the father's house is free in Israel, no matter what the reward is, it's your job to go out and fight anyways. But there's a huge glaring problem, and it, the problem is the tallest guy on the Israel's battlefield, Saul, won't go out and lead the battle, and that's a problem. Now you have this problem in your situation in life. You're going to come across this, and you're not going to have, to have. You're just going to have to figure out how to deal with it. You're going to be in a place where there is a person in a leadership position that won't take the lead. And then what do you do? Now, brethren, here's the answer, and you're not going to like the answer because you're going to have to figure it out. But here's the answer: You can do right in any situation. You can do right. I don't care how miserable, how horrible, how despicable, how absolutely wicked the situation is, you can do right no matter the situation. You say, well, he's supposed to be in charge and he's supposed to lead. Okay, well, is it right for you to buck his authority and scratch his name off of the sign on his door at his office? No, that's not right. <laughs> is it right for you to go say, okay, boss won't tell us what to do, I'm in charge? 
No, no, but do you know how to make a phone call? Hey, we, uh, we don't know what to do here. We need to make this important decision, and uh, I'm just going to make a note here and write down, boss, what you want us to do. Well, now you're using accountability to the boss, and now you're managing the boss. Okay, well, that has to be done. Leadership is lacking everywhere today. But, I mean, it's lacking in your life too, isn't it? Don't you have to learn leadership? I said last uh, two weeks ago, leadership can't be taught. It can only be learned. I don't know if that's true, but I certainly know it has to be learned. You have to figure out how to lead. And David sees a situation here. He says the obvious answer is that we should be fighting this guy. Let's go fight him. And everybody says we can't do that. There's no way we can do that. And David says uh, we, we can do that. That's our job. See all these tools we have? These are for fighting. These aren't for picnics and barbecues. These are for killing other people. Let's go fight him. Verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Is David's heart on the enriching or on the reproach of Israel? <laughs> see, what it's, see where his mind's at? I mean, he mentions the, what, what happens to the guy, but then don't, doesn't anybody care about how we look as a nation before God here? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Everybody got their eyes so fixed on the physical they couldn't see the spiritual. And they needed a guy that came out from the field who was a little bit lovey-dovey and a little bit like to write poems, a little bit like to ponder the stars and look at the sheep and make little poetic things about the Lord is my shepherd too, just like I'm the sheep's shepherd. And then the Lord takes that guy and the Lord says, hey, hey, uh, you know these tough, rough, testosterone-filled battle guys on the on the on the ready i want you david to go show them how it's done the lord needs that anybody here ever just pick up a poem by tennyson and just read a tennyson poem anybody ever just stop and see the flowers at the albertsons and just stop and forget your grocery list for a minute i'm talking to you men for a second you testosterone filled spiritually because you're so manly men do you ever just walk into the Albertsons and say, man, those flowers look amazing. I don't know how they put them all together. I don't know how they match the colors. I, I never really like how they do it. Sometimes I'll just stop. You know, you think I'm weird, but I was thinking care this morning. I'll stop sometimes and just rearrange them a little bit. And I'll, I'll put the brown ones. Nobody else does this? Put the brown ones with the yellow ones and then try to pull some orange in there. And then I put a red, but the red's never the right orange red. And then I put a couple of greens in there. And then someone will be like, that looks pretty good. I might buy that. And then I let them figure it out at the register. I go home and give them to my wife. But sometimes I don't, I don't buy them. I just stop there and take a minute to stop and smell the roses. You ever hear that saying? Quit being so bustled and full of uh, all the problems in your life. You know what has to happen? A man has to come out of a field who spent his time smelling the sage grass or whatever they have over there in Israel and watching the dirty sheep get cleaned up and get fed and get some water and get the wool out of their eyes and take care of the bugs and then just having some time in the evening to relax and look at all the constellations in the heavens and say, man, God, you're amazing. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And then to get, take that guy and just rip him out of his element and throw him in a battlefield. And he's like, who is that guy? Who does he think he is? I've just been talking to the Lord and telling him how much I love him. And he's cursing God in my ear. Do you know how grating that sounds? And they're like, ah, we hear it every day. Kind of just block it out. You guys who work on the job sites, you know how it is. You just got to block it out. You just, I don't even hear it anymore. I, I, I had something. I listened to these war books and... I was listening to one the other day, and I had Elijah with me, and then it automatically plays when I get in the car. And it was cuss word, cuss word, cuss word, and I didn't even hear it. I wasn't even listening to him. Okay, confession, sorry. Everybody's got this scared look on their face. <laughs> I've been on a job site since I was 20. Do you think I've heard a million cuss words or so? Yeah, so I don't even hear him anymore until Elijah's with me. Pulled out of his element, and I thought, oh, I don't know if that's okay. Some of you looking at me like that listen to these movies and watch these movies all the time that are filled with pervasive language, and it doesn't even bother you. Somebody say amen. Don't make me repeat all that and get harder on you. Why don't you spend some time out in the mountains? Why don't you take a little picnic and spend some time in the woods? I mean, at least go to Albertsons and stop for 30 seconds and admire the flowers and say, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is? My God is more powerful than him. Okay, that was enough to get you through the week right there. 
Verse 27, the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done, the thing listed in 25, to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. This is a little over the top reaction here, but it's because it's his older brother. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? We mentioned this last week, but I didn't get to preach or apply it here. Why camest thou down hither? Don't, don't you remember where you came from? You came out of the field. And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Who did David leave them with? A keeper. And those few sheep in the wilderness? His dad's wealthy in Israel. He's got lots of asses. He's got lots of sheep. He's got all kinds, all kinds of cattle. Those few sheep in the wilderness he despises. David, and he despises those sheep. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou camest down that thou mightest see the battle. By the way, there's no battle taking place. <laughs> and David said, what have I now done? Guys, what did I do? I just showed up and brought you some cheeses. I just showed up and brought you some bread. Dad wants a report. I'm trying to do what Dad asked me to do. What do you mean, what have I now? What do you mean? Is there not a cause? He turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. David says, what's going to be done? Why isn't anybody going out there? Are you going to let this guy talk like this about your God? And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Lord, would you please bless the message today? We need to hear from you, and uh, we need to take it and apply it. I don't think anybody here needs to take off on a tangent. Uh, 50 degrees different than they're going, but maybe somebody here needs to straighten up the steering wheel and get on track. Somebody needs to get the car in gear and get rolling. Maybe somebody needs to be willing to uh, get that airplane off of the runway and give you some, uh, give, give you the ability to steer the plane. Lord, I ask that you please speak to hearts this morning as you help us to appreciate David here for a little bit. We all love him, especially at the beginning of his life. I ask that you please help us to see ourselves in him and see that we're able to do and take the position that he did. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Ken Blanchard said, when you're interested in something, you do it only when it's convenient. When you're committed to something, you accept no excuses, only results. You know what David saw here? He didn't see an interest in the battle. His brothers were interested, and they accused him of being interested. David was committed to something, and it had nothing to do with the battle. David was committed to properly representing the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, God the Father, God of the nation of Israel. And he said, I don't want any excuses. I'm committed to serving the Lord. That's it. God's right, and he must be pleased. So he says, I'm not going to take any excuses. And Saul gives excuses in verse 33. And Saul represents all the people on that battlefield. My old preacher said, they're so passive today, they can come up with an excuse for anything. Yep. Yep. I don't know about where all of you work, but you never notice the excuses your coworkers can make to avoid just about anything. I mean, it's time to do this dirty job nobody wants to do. And they just want to make up excuses the whole way. And you're like, there's eight of us. We ought to be able to get this thing done in five minutes, but you're going to drag it out for an hour because two of you are put in charge that don't have any ambition, and you're just going to hide under the stairwell in the corporate building, or you're just going to sit in your truck on the job site and stay warm because it dropped down to 15 degrees and there's a light breeze, and you're going to make an excuse, well, it's just not good on the equipment to start it up and run it right away, so we need to let it warm up for an hour while we go get coffee, whatever it is, right? <laughs> Excuses. Because why? You're not committed. You're not committed to the success of the company that you work for. You're committed to getting a paycheck at the end of the week, and you're kind of interested in the company doing well. And that's how most people live. And David shows up, and he just doesn't fit in. The majority just kind of has this passive attitude towards everything in life. And David shows up and just upsets everybody's apple cart. And they don't really appreciate it. 
you know why you're not going to stand up to those things? Because they won't appreciate you as soon as you start opening your mouth and saying, I don't do those things. Let's get busy. Somebody showed up on my job site one time and said, you guys really get after it out here. Yeah, and you guys put my boss $150,000 in debt on every job. Come on, come on. Some, there's, there's a balance somewhere. Maybe I'm too hard of a driver and maybe you're too lazy, but somewhere there's a balance here. Quit making excuses for every time that you don't want to address the enemy and address the dirty job and the situation where you might get hurt or have to sacrifice your life and get after it. <laughs> It's just kind of this Montana passive thing. Well, we got to, you know, it ain't that big a deal to get my family in order. It ain't that big of a deal, you know, to let the kids go the way they're going to go. It ain't that big of a deal if I show up to work this week because I work for myself. It ain't that big of a deal if I get down and get after it and sit down and work up these next paperwork that I have to do because we all hate paperwork and that's why we swing hammers. I know how it is. I know how it is. And you have to to be more than interested in the things that are going on in this life. And it doesn't get involved in committing yourself to concrete, myself, or committing yourself to wood and nails, or committing yourself to a hospital, or committing yourself to driving a truck. It gets into the point of saying, God, you're the most important thing, and all these things are reasons for me to be able to please and to serve you. When you can get that right, you can get committed to the right thing. The other things will be right, and everybody else will feel bad about it. And you say, oh, I know, I'm going to make people feel bad. No, you're just going to be a jerk if you do that because you skip the step of abiding in him and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't get to skip steps. You keep the main thing the main thing. Isn't that the saying from the 80s and the 90s? Keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is the Lord Jesus Christ and keeping your eyes on him. And then everything else settles into place. What's Eliab's problem? Well, Eliab in chapter 17, verse 13, says he followed Saul. Look at verse 13, the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul into the battle. And the names of the three sons that went to battle were Eliab. I'm just going to mention him for a minute here. Eliab followed Saul. You say, how did he follow Saul? I think he followed Saul in three aspects. He followed Saul, number one, in fear. In verse 11, it says, everybody was afraid, and Saul was afraid. Now, Eliab's following the wrong guy, but he followed Saul in his fear. I think he followed Saul in his fury. We know Saul gets angry. It happens later in the chapter, and uh, later in the next chapter, rather. And in verse 28, did you notice what Eliab said? It said that what the Bible said about him. Eliab's anger was kindled against David for pretty much nothing. For bringing him lunch, he lost it on him. Talk about hangry, man. This guy follows Saul in fury. And I think unrighteous anger comes from a root of not trusting God. You got a situation and everything's falling apart and it's not going how you intended and all the things you work towards, your efforts have been told, com turned into complete inefficiency and you get angry about it. And somebody else doesn't see the problem and you get angry at them. And somebody else comes in the s scene and doesn't immediately recognize what's happening and you, you get angry. And what's the root of all that? Well, you think about it for a week or so, but I think it's from not trusting God. I mean, the Lord's trying to do something in your situation, and maybe you prayed about it, and maybe you didn't. But instead of getting angry, if you prayed about it, you can go straight to the Lord. Lord, am I doing the wrong thing here? This is your battle. This is your situation. This is your thing you wanted me to do. Am I doing the right thing? Am I even starting off right? But if you haven't prayed about it and you haven't talked to the Lord about it, it's just get angry at the first person that, that comes closest to you. Anger always hurts the people closest to you. And unrighteous anger is from not trusting God. And Eliab's heart is not on in interested in spiritual things whatsoever. But he followed Saul in fury, not interested in the Lord's things. And then he followed Saul in failure. The Bible says that Eliab, uh, back there in 16, verse 7, Samuel shows up there and says, I have refused him. The Lord tells Samuel, I have refused Eliab. The first one's the wrong one. How does that work? How many of you have heard my oldest child thing on the first one's the wrong one? A couple of you. Well, not enough of you. How is it that Ishmael comes before Isaac? How is it that Esau is the elder, but Jacob, the younger, shall serve the elder? How come the first one's always the wrong one? Who's born first, Cain or Abel? The murderer. <laughs> it's always the first one's the wrong one. You've got to watch out for these oldest kids. You've got to keep one eye on them all the time. They'll... they'll take charge when they're not supposed to take they'll tell you how much they care about you and they have to be responsible but if they really care about themselves say who are you speaking to i'm an oldest child i can say what i'm saying 
You gotta watch out for those oldest childs. Why? Because they had mommy and daddy's full undivided attention until the second one came along. They had the camera photos on them all the time. They had every little thing. I mean, there wasn't a thread out of place. If your sock got turned 10 degrees sideways, it got to get fixed because you're the oldest child. Can't make any messes. Everything's got to be neat and clean and perfect and tidy and organized and have a box and a place for everything and 15 bags to do 15 different jobs and have the same tools in different bags. Why? Because that's how it should be. It just should be that way. It absolutely should be that way. You know what the Lord's response to all those physical things is? I have refused him. <coughs> Amen. Now, I'm going to spiritualize this, so just hold on, but can you let that soak in? Do you know that uh, there was one man that showed up in the New Testament? <coughs> and he was the firstborn. He was the firstborn among many brethren. His name was Jesus Christ. He's the only firstborn that turned out right. <laughs> turns out right because he says I only do those things that the father desires of me now if you're going to figure this out you have a disadvantage if you're firstborn because you had all this physical importance put on things that aren't that important how many of you firstborn children have ever been caught at the supermarket straightening cans on the shelf for no reason what is with that <laughs> why would you do that they pay other people the cans overpriced already with inflation good night and then you're like, well, I took one off, so it looked better when that one was there. Oh, let me straighten that one. So only firstborns do that. It's the strangest thing. And the problem, if you want to know what it is, it's an overemphasis on the physical things. And Lord's not interested in all those uh, unimportant details of physical things. He's important. In, uh, he, he thinks in, uh, spiritual things are important, and he puts an emphasis on those. And one day you're going to have to yield your oldest childness to the Lord and say, Lord, I think there's a usefulness in being exact and precise, and it's certainly called for in certain trades of automotive and mechanics and accounting. And there's different places where it's extremely important. People's lives are at stake sometimes, or huge financial amounts with just a decimal place causing the difference. It's very important. But until it's submitted to the Lord, you're just an Eliab. I know what you're like, little brother. You don't care about anything dirty, you stink, you smell like the sheep of the field out here, we're all in battle, you're an embarrassment to me. And the Lord says, Eliab, you missed it again. You're always missing it. You're always impressed about how you look and your stature and your good countenance and dressing up for Samuel coming in. And Samuel was impressed, but I wasn't impressed. And David shows up all grubby from the field, and the Lord says, that's the guy, that's the guy I want. See that guy's heart? Oh, no, you guys can't see the heart. That's the guy I want. Get your heart right, everything else will be right. Careful who you make a hero out of. Eliab's got the wrong heroes. He thinks Saul is his hero. He even kind of enters into the language of Goliath. Look in chapter 17, 28 again. He says, Why camest thou hither? Flip back to 17, 8. We'll go back and forth here a couple times. What does Goliath say? He cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out, one to set your battle in array? Eliab heard Goliath's words, and then he says the same phrase to his brother, why are you come down to the battle? Just like Goliath said. Eliab said, I know your heart, you're proud, in verse 28. Look at verse 8 again, what does Goliath say? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants of Saul? What is that? That's pride. Choose a man for you, and let him come down to me. And then Eliab says, you're here to see the battle. And what does Goliath say? Verse 9, if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. This kid here is influenced by all the wrong things. He's just repeating what Goliath said because he's intimidated by fear. He's got fear. He's got anger. He's despising when he says those few sheep. He makes false accusations. He's bearing a false witness against David, saying, I know the pride and naughtiness of thine heart. In psychology, Freud called that projection. Project. When you see sins of other people, uh, sins of yourself in other people, is pride. And then he accuses Dave of be David of being naughty. Naughty is uh, a nothingness, a nothing man. He's accusing him of being a worthless so-and-so. <laughs> Must be another job site term. That's what he's calling his little brother. False accusation and filthy speech, probably, that the Bible kind of covers up for you. He starts out unthankful. 
doesn't appreciate the lunch that he's brought, and he ends with pride and sitting in complacency with the crowd. And David says, is there not a cause? What have I done? Isn't there a cause to be here, guys? What are we doing sitting around? Is there not a cause? Eliab says, you're the delivery boy. <laughs> Go back home. Go back to the pasture. You just want to see what's going on so you have a story to tell, like those journalists that pester us every time we turn around. And I've found six or eight sins here of Eliab, and up to this point in David's life, I can't find one sin of David. I know he sins. I know he's very guilty later. But David is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shows up here and he says, let no man's heart fail him. He says, I slew a lion and a bear, and I smote him and caught him by the beard and slew him. And the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. I've been through some trials, Eliab. I've been through some tough times in my life, and I've watched the Lord come through. And this one, yep, it's a bigger trial than any trial I've ever been through. But it's not all that unlike a lion and a bear. It's not all that unlike the devil to show up as a lion and a bear that the Lord puts me in a place I can barely handle, but then with his help, I handle the lion and I handle the bear. And this Philistine will be like one of those. David says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause in suppressing sins? Is there not a cause? You say, well, it's not that big a deal. Everybody else does that. Well, we have to make a living. Well, you got to do it sometime. Everybody else knows, the, knows how it is. Well, it's just how it is in America. You make all kinds of excuses, but is there not a cause in saying, I want to be clean? <laughs> Paid off for David here. David didn't have any doubts. You know, in the Old Testament, they don't get this guaranteed of eternal security where the Spirit comes on them and never leaves them. In the Old Testament, that Spirit left Saul multiple times. It left other men in the Old Testament. And David says, I ain't afraid to die. <laughs> I was talking to the Lord this morning, and if I die, I'll talk to him this afternoon in heaven. I'm not afraid to die. <laughs> Is there not a cause in suppressing sins and laying apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness? Extreme excess of nothingness, naughtiness. David says, I'm not naughty. I put that stuff aside. The guys who are sitting around doing nothing are these thousands of men that came out to a battle and are too scared to get their pitchforks in action and go to the fight. David says, I just like being clean. He said, I don't know how to be clean. I can tell you how to be clean. I can tell you how to be clean real easy. Lord, I messed up again. Would you wash me in your blood and cleanse me? Lord, I just don't want to be dirty anymore. Would you please cleanse me in your blood? I know I got saved. I know your blood cleansed my soul. But I want your blood to be applied to my spirit. I want to be the Christian that actually is accused of being like Jesus Christ. Anybody ever had somebody say, oh, you think you're Jesus when you're trying to explain something in the Bible? And you're like, well, no, but thanks for the compliment. <laughs> I am trying to be like the Lord, and I don't get to do everything the Lord did, like walk on water and heal people and rebuke Pharisees and all that. I don't, I don't, this isn't my daily life. But I am trying to be like the Lord where I care about other people and I minister and I see what's going on in people's thoughts because of what comes out of their heart. And I have a chance to say, hey, you need some preaching. And I have a chance to say, you need some compassion. I have a chance to say, Holy Spirit, show me what to say here. And then out of my mouth, the next words that come up unfold all of the, <laughs> the it unlocks the lock to the problem. I'll give you one example. And you need to this isn't this spooky, weird stuff. This just happens if you stay close to the Lord. It just happens. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, they came up to me and, uh, on the college campus, and they said, are you with that other guy? I said, oh, sometimes I, I associate with him. And they're like, you guys are both out here preaching. Yeah, I'm with him. Are you one of those Baptists that believes once saved, always saved? I said, yes, I am. Okay, I'm familiar with that teaching, but can you give me one reason in the Bible why that's true? And I said, uh, sure, Lord, give me an answer here. Romans 8 uh, talks about adoption. So suppose that your parents, for whatever reason, put you up for adoption and you got better parents. And this girl said, that would be nice. I could have picked anything on eternal security. Lord, could have given me grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed. Could have given me Romans 8, the end of the, nothing shall separate us. Could have given me anything, right? John 10, I never knew you, all that stuff. I said, we'll come back to that. So I got adopted, and it's 
fixed and I'm secure. There's nothing can change it, but that's my soul. And if you read Romans 8, it talks about adoption twice, and the second time I'm waiting for an adoption, that's the redemption of my body. Two adoptions. I said, that's why I believe that it's fixed and it can't be changed because I'm placed in God's family and I'm not in the devil's family anymore and I can't get kicked out of the family no matter how bad I treat my other family members or my father himself. I said, by the way, did you know when you're adopted that it can't be undone? It's a legal process that is fixed and can't be changed in America and also in Rome when Paul wrote the gospel of, or wrote the book of Romans. And she said, well, my mom, and then she went on and just revealed the abundance of bitterness and unforgiveness in her heart. You know what Ephesians 5 says? It says that, or Ephesians 4, it says we need to forgive other people. You need to forgive other people even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Do you know that you're no perfect person? Your sins put Jesus Christ on the cross too, and you need to understand God's forgiveness for you is the forgiveness you can have for other Christians. And then I paused and waited for a response. And the first words out of her mouth, she just has a lot of bitterness and anger and uh, the verse of clamor and malice in her heart. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, but uh, the first word out of your mouth was she, and the first word out of your mouth should have been I. I need to get rid of the things that are in my heart and have forgiveness towards other people who have done genuinely done wrong to me. Let's try it again. I just think that she needs to work on a lot of things. <laughs> this is the end of our conversation today. <laughs> and I hope that she gets some help. I'm going to hope that the things sink in later. Is there not a cause in suppressing sin? See, what good does it do to go yell at a bunch of people on the street corner? What good does it do to go on a college campus and make a fool out of yourself when it's snowing outside? That didn't really turn out to be a lot of fun, except that conversation and a couple good other conversations came out of it. What good did it do? It suppressed sin. It said, this is wrong. You said, well, she didn't make a decision right there. Do you, you don't even know if she's saved. Correct and correct. You know what I did? I put a stick of dynamite in the field and blasted a rock into five pieces, and now it's her job to figure out how to get five pieces of the rock out instead of one giant boulder that's impossible. Amen. I took a plow, and I ran it down there, and I said, your fallow ground needs broken up. And I dumped a little water on there, and I said, let the Lord's sunshine be a help to you, and you have to go through these things in your time, not right in front of me so I can have a result that I want to see. <clears throat> I think, I think in our crowd, I'm going to say fundamentalists, although I try to distance myself from the name, I believe in more than the fundamentals. I believe the whole Bible. And I believe in figuring out how to apply the whole Bible. And I figured out a long time ago the whole Bible isn't written to me, but the whole thing is written for me. And I can preach any of it, but some of it doctrinally isn't going to fit. So I better learn the difference. And I've learned that the Lord will use you if you stay close to him and just be willing to use your voice and your body and your limbs and your hands and feet, as they say in all the modern churches today, for the Lord. If you'll be willing to do that for the Lord, he'll put you in the right spot and you don't have to worry about you getting the glory from it. Is there not a cause in suppressing sin? You ought to suppress it in your own life. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness. Say, preacher, what does that mean? It means you don't get to say, that's bad, I'm going to stop thinking about that, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that, stop thinking about that thing, I don't want to do that. It just doesn't work. It never has worked. Anybody here addicted to heroin? Nobody? Okay, good. We'll use that for an example. Heroin's bad. I shouldn't shoot up. Heroin's terrible. Man, that stuff's bad. Stop thinking about heroin. Don't do heroin. What is everybody in this room thinking about? That's the problem with the addiction help today. It's a mess from the beginning. Let's talk about your problem. I'm so-and-so, and I'm a drunk. I'm an alcoholic, or whatever it is. No, I'm a saved sinner, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and I'm a saint. That's what I am. Oh, I may do a lot of wrong things, and I may have sins that are attributed to me that I need to confess and forsake and move on, but I am not those things. I'm in Jesus Christ. I'm forgiven. 
I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I'm in the family of God. I'm bought. I'm washed. I'm sanctified. That's what I am. Why well, don't somebody sit down at a meeting and have people say that? You need to reckon yourself dead to sin, put off the old man, and then yield to instruments of righteousness to the Lord. Lord, i got lots of problems, but I need your help today. What are you thinking about? Lord, uh, I need your forgiveness again. Would you wash me in your blood and help me to be cleansed and be whole and be used by you? What are you thinking about? I'm thinking about a clean heart and a clean vessel and light shining out of the vessel that the Lord can shine wherever he wants to shine it. I mean, all the vessels are got cracks and all the vessels have rough edges and none of them are perfect because they're made by hand. And they're in this clay in this body of an instrument that's supposed to be righteousness or it can be an instrument of unrighteousness. Say so you bashed fundamentalism a second ago. And let me bash it again. Holy living is not a list of standards. Holy living is following the voice of the shepherd. You say, how do we keep track of everything? How do we make sure? You don't. That's how. You don't. It'll never work. You'll fail every time. Because I know people, and they're so spiritual, and they have all these standards. And they, yeah, I know them too. And I know their kids, and I talk to them. And they don't have any respect for me because they don't respect their parents because they think I think like their parents. And then we get them out of this church and in my crowd that I, we like to hoop and holler and hang out and have a good time and preach at each other, pull stuff out of the Bible the Lord doesn't even know, and we get a good time going sometimes. And then the singing gets good. And then the preaching gets right down to your heart. And then these kids come with us over to the Missoula meeting and they say, what? What's going on here? This is the Lord. That's what's going on here. It was right in front of you the whole time, but you thought I was your parents, and I'm not your parents. <laughs> I love this book, and I love the Lord more than anybody in this room. You say, well, you're supposed to be a pastor and be a shepherd and lead the flock. I do love you guys. Second, third, and fourth to the Lord, this book, and my family, and a couple other things. <laughs> and that's the right order. And if you have that right order, then everything else will be right. You say, well, I just think. Try it out for 40 years, or better yet, watch somebody else who already tried it out and don't go down the same path. I got to deal with this stuff too. I got teenagers and a 16 year old in my house. I got to figure it out too. Amen? It doesn't ever quit. The Lord doesn't ever let up your whole life. I'll be 80 years old trying to figure something else out. Brother Habman, pray for him. He's got uh, more health issues after the stroke and injuring his arm. He's got, got surgery this morning on his heart. So keep him in prayer. It never stops, it never goes away. Is there not a cause? Why don't you, mom and dad, get that sin out of your life and quit worrying about what everybody thinks of you and the image that your kids are putting on you? Why don't you just say, I don't care. I've made mistakes, but haven't we all? But because we've all made mistakes, I want to get those mistakes made right. And the Lord understands, and I understand. Amen. You'd be surprised, brethren. That verse says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Let's say it again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. I don't even know how to apply that. I take that to the Lord and I say, Lord, I got saved and I'm trying to do right. Would you take care of my house? You say, well, I made a mess for 40 years. I've heard of many people who got saved in their 30s, 40s, and 50s whose children got saved later because they got saved and turned their life to the Lord and started living for the Lord. And they said, well, at least they got somewhere they can come to. At least they got somewhere they can come home to if they want to come back to the, to the Father's house. Is there not a cause in suppressing sins? I got four more. We're not going to have time for any of these. Is there not a time of cause for studying the scriptures? This was one quick thing about studying the scriptures. It's not only my job to study the scriptures. It's your job too. You say, I don't even know how to study. You don't start by sitting down for two hours. Just like you don't start with a sweet hour of prayer, you start with a sweet five minutes of prayer. But if you want to study, you need to pick up your Bible, get one of these reference Bibles. It's got all kinds of references in the middle. And just pick a verse that stands out to you the next time you read your Bible and say, I'm going to see if there's anything to cross-reference that. <laughs> and find some things in your Bible and spend some time there chewing on the Word of God. And spend some time studying it on your own. 
I give everybody in this room on Sunday morning enough to study for six hours. I give you verses and scripture and thoughts and some stuff I'm sure isn't true. Undoubtedly, I say things that aren't true. Nobody can talk for an hour and not say something wrong. Somebody say amen. Amen. I got one amen. Okay, I got six more. Good. I guarantee, somebody called me once, or called a friend of mine once here in church and said, I heard that preacher and he, I, I heard three things that he said wrong. I'm like, brother, they weren't even paying attention. I guarantee 20 per message. Guaranteed. <laughs> Write it down. I'll sign my name at the bottom of it at the end of the sermon. I'm sure I say 20 things wrong any Sunday. Well, why don't you take the things I said right, huh? You say, oh, that Bible's full of contradictions, and we can't understand, and the big words. You understand plenty. You're back there with the battle on the side of the hill making excuses for why you don't want to study the... Is there not a cause to study the scriptures and say, I'm accountable to these words, being that I am a really privileged American living in the New Testament day and have 16 Bibles in my house. Is there not a cause for me to know these words of God that the Lord gave me and I don't have to go to the temple and listen and try to remember what he said an hour ago or a week ago or a month ago? I can open up those pages anytime I want and let the light of the word of God come off of there. But I have to study. Why don't you study what I say and say, hey, I don't know if I agreed with that. Okay, good. Study. Ask me. I'll give you more verses on it. If I'm wrong, I'll change what I'm teaching. Some of you have been here long enough to hear me change what I'm teaching before. I'll do it again. I'm not so stuck on where I got trained and what I got taught and what I heard preached that I have to say the same thing for the next 50 years. Good night. This book's got all kinds of things in it every day that open up and come alive and undo things that you thought you had figured out. You ought to study the scriptures because there's a cause. Is there not a cause in serving the Savior? You know what those servants always know? I love the servants in the Bible. Did you catch that servant last week that said, Oh, yeah, Saul, you got a demon and you're messed up in the head and you need some music. That's what we think you need. I know just the guy. Who knew just the guy? The servants. The servants always know. I love the servants. Just working in the background, just down in the dirt. They got their own problems, family things going on and kind of, you know, lower class and don't have the posh and the speech that the upper class has. But they know what's going on. They know how it is in the trenches. They know what reality is because they have to deal with it every day. And those servants say, I know a guy, his name's David. He's been in war a couple times. He's fought some battles. He hangs out there in the fields. He takes care of sheep. Real faithful guy, good-looking guy. You wouldn't mind having him in your courtroom. He's real polite. He has a good presence, and he can play on that harp amazing. He just commands the attention of the room every time he's there. So I was like, yeah, go get him for me. Yeah, go get him, servant. Thanks. Uh, David, what's his name? Son of Jesse? Yeah, go get him. And then Saul forgets who he is by the time the battle takes place with Goliath. Saul didn't know, but the servants knew. Servants always know. Servants always know what's going on in the Bible. Remember Jesus shows up and says, uh, mine hour has not yet come, but I'm going to turn this water into wine. But don't let anybody know. Parentheses, John 2, 9. But the servants knew. I love that. Every time I read that, I said, there's got to be something in there. Finally, I got to Bible school and found out there is something in there. Figured out how to find out. I figured out how to study. But the servants know. You know, somebody took a notebook, a three-ring binder, and they said every time they came to this passage in the scriptures, they wrote down this topic, and then they started coming to these topics, and more and more topics began to build. Well, there's a good way to study the Bible. Get you a three-ring binder, get you a notebook, and start writing things down that stand out to you, and then how do you correlate things? You can't use a concordance to find everything. You look up servants, you'll find 10,000 references or whatever it is. You're going to have to pay attention while you're reading. You come across that servant of of uh, Naaman there, and Naaman says, uh, man, if I could just get this leprosy healed, man, if I could just get this leprosy healed, I could be somebody. Man, I'm already a captain in the army, but I have this leprosy problem, and man, I just can't get this thing taken care of. Isn't there a physician in all of Israel that can take care of this? And the Naaman's maid servant said, uh, yeah, what? don't you know about Elijah? Everybody knows Elijah. Who's Elijah? Elijah, he does miracles. Like, he can show, get God to show up in a situation, and he can heal you without even Lincoln. I mean, he, he just touch you, walk by you, look at you, say the words. I'm, is he some kind of magician? No, he like talks to God, like Jehovah. Oh, I've heard of Jehovah. Yeah, this is the guy. Send for him. Bring him. And they go send for Elijah, and Elijah's like, uh, Naaman gets the letter, and the letter says, go dunk in the Jordan seven times. And he crumbles up the letter and throws it across the room. Who does this guy think he is? But the servants knew. The servants knew what Elijah could do. And a servant went up to Nahum, one of his, one of his soldiers, said, Hey, um, I know you're fuming mad right now. <laughs> I know you can't believe that guy just dissed on you like that because you are like the captain of your king's army and, and you're a, you know, drive a Mercedes and like, 
people should bow down to you and give you first red carpet treatment at the rest. I know you're that guy, but um, it was kind of rude. Those preachers are always saying rude things. Um, but, I mean, how hard is it to just go down like seven times? Go do it. Just try it out. What if you don't try it? Then you'll never know. Who knew that it would work? Another servant. The servants always know. He dips down seven times and he gets healed. Elijah and Elisha are taking a walk one day. Elijah's kind of grumpy. This is after the juniper tree. And God says, Elijah, you need to change your attitude. And Elijah says, I ain't changing my attitude. And the Lord says, Elijah, there's 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. And Elijah says, some standard that is God, huh? Haven't bowed down. What are they saying? What are they speaking for me? They're not out preaching and killing people like I am. Look at me. And the Lord says, I don't have the same standard for them as I have for you, Elijah. They haven't bowed the knee to Baal, and that's quite a testament to their to their life and the risk that they take. And Elijah says, I don't care. And the Lord says, I have 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And Elijah says, I ain't changing my attitude. And the Lord says, okay, find your replacement. And Elijah's not done that day, but he's done. And Elijah takes a walk there, and the Lord says, there he is. Go throw your mantle on him. This kid, I suppose, is a kid. He's leading a bunch of oxen in the field. He's with the 12th, 12th group of oxen. Maybe there's 24 of them out there. And that kid says, what? I'll be right there. Can I bowl these oxen and offer a sacrifice to say goodbye to my parents? He's not like the guy in the New Testament that said, I need to bury my father. He's like, I'm going to go do that, and I'm going to follow you. I have to take care of things in order. He was serious. So he goes and has a sacrifice, and Elijah waits for him. He follows Elijah, and then Elijah says, you just wait here. I'm going to go to the next town. And Elisha says, I'm not going to the next town. What are you talking about? I'm not going to sit here and wait for you to just go on your way. And I'm, You anointed me. You, I'm following you. You're stuck with me now. And so Elijah says, ah, just hang out here. And Elijah says, no, I'm following you to the next town too. And they get to the next town. And all the servants of the prophet, and all the students there, the Bible students, they show up outside. And they're like, there's Elijah and Elisha coming up the road. We haven't seen Elijah in years. What's going on here? We heard that thing about the prophets. What's going on? Elijah's got this grumpy look on his face. So they're like, well, I don't know if we should talk to him. Hey, Elisha, Elisha, do you know that your master is going to be taken from your head today? And what does Elisha, the servant that poured water on the hands of Elijah, say? Yay, I know it. Hold you your peace. What did Elisha know? You don't even know how he knew. Elisha knew that Elijah was going to get raptured in a fiery chariot that day. How did he know? Nobody knows how he knew. I love that passage. And then just so you don't miss it, they go to the next town, and Elijah says, hang out here, Elijah. She says, I ain't hanging out here. I'm following you all the way out. I know what's happening. And Elijah says, oh, if you want to follow me, follow me. But if you don't, don't. <laughs> Grumpy pants, Elijah. <laughs> and they get to the next town, and Elisha says, uh, hey, sons of the prophets, how's it going? Elijah put his mantle on me, and I'm just trying to be faithful and follow him and pour some water on his hands. And they say, Know you not that your master shall be taken from your head today? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, I know it. Hold you your peace. Israel doesn't know. The king doesn't know. Nobody knows that. But the servants knew. The servants always know what God's doing. Is there not a cause in being a servant to the Savior? It's a good place to be. It's a good place to be to bow your head and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You might find out some supernatural things that are going on around you that you're just completely oblivious to. Is there not a cause in having some supplication in the spirit? Some supplication. Some hanging out with the Lord. Some spending some time in quiet with the Lord. A friend of mine said he was jogging recently. He's just jogging along, talking to the Lord. The Lord and him were going back and forth about something. He didn't tell me what it was. And he got to weep in there while he's jogging. He take, pulls off into somebody's yard under a bush next to the, it's kind of away from their house. And he's, he's just weeping. He's on his face. He's bawling. Him and the Lord just talking and just hashing something out. Finally came to a point of can't go a step further without dealing with this thing. And he's sobbing and dripping snot and talking to the Lord and kind of gets through this thing and him and the Lord are okay after that and he submitted to it or quit it or repented or whatever it was he didn't tell me what it was he said I'm wiping the 
tears and snot off my face, and I look up, and there's a roofer on the house that I had stopped next to doing a new roof. He said, the roofer looked down at me and was like, and I looked up at the roofer like, and then I kept on jogging. <laughs> <laughs> he told me later, he's like, I don't know why all these Christians need to come down to the altar. Why don't they just get along with the Lord when the Lord deals with them? Now, if we had an altar here, I'd use it, and I'd call you forward to it. And I've had some real precious moments there. And he told me the same thing. He said, I've had some real special moments with the Lord at an altar in a church a couple times in my life. But why not have some supplication in the spirit with the Lord and say, God, it's just me and you, and I think you're wrong. And the Lord will say, is that so? Let's talk about it. I don't know how to explain it, except when you go to the Lord in honesty, in a desperation, in an I really need an answer, and this isn't right, somehow the thing starts to get unraveled like a big ball of fishing twine that just, fishing line that just kind of, oh, all of a sudden it's starting to get straight again. How did that happen? It never happens on its own. Anybody fishing? <laughs> it's like a big ball of a problem, just a big old eagle's nest there in your fishing reel, and then the Lord's like, just pull here, here, here. Remember that thing? Oh, yeah, Lord, I did that. Remember that? Remember I told you about this? Remember that preacher said and you didn't? I forgot about all those things, Lord. Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. Again, again. And the Lord says, I know. And you're forgiven. If you've never had that, missing out on the supplication of the Spirit. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Brother, then there's work to be done in this last days. <clears throat> I think we're in the last days. I don't care if Martin Luther thought so too. I still think we're in the last days. Oh, you're one of those Christians who think the Lord's coming back any time. Yep, yeah, I'm one of those crazy guys that thinks God might come out of the sky at any time. Yep. Yeah. And when he does, I would like to be in a place where I have been trying to suppress sin in my life like to be in a place where I say, well, I don't know the whole Bible, but I've been studying the scriptures and applying them as I learn them. I'd like to be in a place where I'm serving the Lord and I'm close to the Lord. And there's some debatable things in the thing Bible about the rapture that people can't agree on. Anytime you find prophecies that people can't agree on, it hasn't been revealed fully. At least to some of them. Or most of them, maybe everybody. I want to be a servant, Lord. I want to know. When this thing's getting close, I want to know. There's the last trump. Well, there's some previous trumps. Who hears those? How many are there? How far apart are they? You get to hear those, and then you got a couple hours. You get a couple seconds. You get a couple days. How does that work? You don't know. Neither do I. But if you're a servant, you'll know. Servants always know. Is there not a cause and some humble petition, some supplication in the spirit? Lord, I'm probably wrong. You're probably right, but I don't like this thing. You know why they need to make sure <laughs> that you fight? 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I'm not just going to stand here and talk and say somebody should do it. I'm not just going to stand here and talk and say, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Everybody, is there not a cause? You're well-equipped. You're well-armed. The Lord's our king. We can defeat anybody. I'm not just going to stand here and talk. Somebody tell Saul, I'll go out there. I'll do it. If I die, I die. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. It's okay. My life's not the most important thing in this world. Jesus Christ is the most important thing in this world. Amen? Amen. And then you get to thinking down those lines. You get dangerous. <laughs> Is there not a cause to go out there and fight so some other people don't fail? I heard a Billings police officer retired say one time he trained in the military and special forces and came back to the BPD after he got out of the Army. He said, I was chasing a guy down an alley, and I'd trained for it a thousand times. Trained for it a thousand times. He said, I knew exactly what was going to happen. The guys run down an alley. They always do this. They jump behind a dumpster. Sometimes they do it to ditch their guns. Sometimes they do it so they can jump out from behind the dumpster and shoot you. I trained for a thousand times. I'm chasing him. I'm catching up to him. I got him on the run. Then up comes a dumpster. He dumps behind the dumpster, dumpster and I just stop. 
because I know exactly what he's going to do. And he pops out behind that dumpster, of course, and he had a gun, and he's shooting people. And I shot him. One shot, took him out, done. And he said, he said, I think I was supposed to be there that day. This guy's not even saved. I think, he pointed to the, he didn't say God, but he said, I think I was supposed to be there that day. Those other cops at the beginning of the alley, they haven't trained for this. I've trained for it my whole life. And I think I was supposed to be there that day. That's a testimony of a lost guy, crane operator on a job site when I met him. And you know what you ought to do, Christian? Yeah, everybody else is going to sit around and make excuses. You need to remember there's a cause to go out and fight so other people don't fail. What happened if one of those other, this was his words, forgive me and everything. What if one of those other cream puff cops, that's what he called him when he got kind of into his story and corrected him before he corrected himself. What if one of them was there? They would have got shot. They would have had to go knock on the door of their family and all the things. He said, I trained for it a thousand times. I saw it happen before it happened. And I was the guy that was supposed to be there that day. Why? Because he was prepared. He's just a servant. He's just willing. He's just faithful to fight for somebody else, his family to fight for his other brothers in battle, whether they're doing it the way you think they should do it or not. To fight for truth so he can give a clear answer to his fellow Christians. Christians, you've got to be studying the Bible. You have to learn this book. I give you a lot of stuff on Sunday morning. I think I give you too much on Sunday afternoon. You need to be figuring some of this stuff out on your own. I give you so much that you, that, that, that you don't check on it and verify it, and then you think you know it, but you don't know it because you go to teach it, and then you don't realize that there's more behind it that... You need to be studying. You need to be an example to other believers. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Is there not a cause? I think there's a great cause. I think David had the right message that day. And he went out and fought. Win or lose, he went out and fought. And then, of course, we know the story. He won. He won the battle. You're not going to win them all. But you've got to get off the mountaintop and go down in the valley. And you've got to fight that battle and say, no matter what happens to me, I'm going to do right. I can do right. I can forgive that person. I can take that burden to the Lord. I can submit myself to him in these areas. I can take my gifts that are good things that he gave me and say, Lord, these are your gifts, and I want to use them for you. I want to put them in subjection to you and be yielded to you. And forget about all the addiction and everything and talking about all the sins of the church. and all. The, I don't preach on specific sins a whole lot. You know what will fix all that that I've found? You stay close to the Lord, and you can't stay close to the Lord and close to your sin. You can't do it. All right, sin, sin. Paul lists the sins, but you need to stay close to the Lord, and that will fix everything. 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 Lord, I ask you please bless this message today. And we're all in a hurry to get out of town and get on the road. I ask you help us to just calm our minds for a minute, hold our horses for just a second. Or if you're speaking to somebody today here, I ask you please help them to be honest with you. They don't have to tell me a thing. They don't have to tell their husband or their wife unless you put it on them to do so. They don't have to tell their kids or their family. But between you and them, Lord, between you and them, Please and help some people here today. Help someone in this room today to see what stands between you and them. To say, I'm willing, I'm submitted, you're in charge, God, I'm wrong. I'll take the wrong, Lord, I will admit that I'm wrong. Help me to forgive, help me to, to press on and forget. Lord, we need your help. We have lots of men that have gone on before us, and we can imitate and emulate the men that we saw in our life that were spiritual, but none of those spiritual men wanted us to imitate them. They wanted us to love you and look to you and keep our affections on you. And Lord, I ask you to help us to learn how to do that. I ask you to help us to attempt to do that, encourage others to do that by exemplifying it in our own life. Lord, I ask you to speak to hearts today, speak to us throughout the week. I ask you to help us to learn what it means to trust you, to abide in you, to love you, and to respond right in any situation that comes up. 
Let's stand. The band will be dismissed with a couple of verses. Have you got a song? Yeah. 204. 204. Somewhere.